welcome back. I'm Adam Rosen, and thanks for tuning in. Today I want to talk to you about a topic that's not a fun topic to talk about, but something that has to be talked about, and that is what happens if you get an infection in your total knee replacement? When patients come in, we talk in the office about all the risks, and infection is a risk. Um, it's not a never event. It can happen. And even in most studies where they show about 2% of people can get an infection after a total knee replacement, when I'm talking to my patients, I tell them, that risk sounds very low, but if you're that one or two out of 100, you don't care about the other 99 or 98% of people that did fine because you have to go through this. So when we talk about optimization, this is before surgery and you've heard some of my other talks about why it's important that we make you as optimized as possible before surgery because if the risk of infection is about 2%, just knowing that if you have some medical issue, your risk is higher. So if you're overweight, your risk of an infection is higher. If you have diabetes, even more so if your diabetes is not well controlled, your risk is higher. If you've had a solid, solid organ transplant, like a liver transplant or a kidney transplant, and you're on immunosuppressive drugs, your risk is higher. If you have rheumatoid arthritis or some other rheumatologic disorder that makes you immunocompromised, your risk is higher. So I have a much longer and even deeper discussion with those patients just so they truly understand the risks of what they're getting themselves into. Um, when patients go through surgery, there can be a couple different types of infection. So, you know, we talk about an infection that can be acute or chronic. So an acute infection is usually an infection of less than a few weeks. This is typically after surgery. So you go home, the knee is red, hot, warm, swollen, it just doesn't look normal. And then you have this kind of drainage sensation, fevers, chills. There's lots of different symptoms that you can get. But they're all things that are just not normal. And that's hard for a lot of people because why? Well, you had surgery and it's swollen and it's warm and it's painful. And there's always this fine line of is it normal or is it infected? And, and that's where the expertise of your doctor and your care team come into handy because if these are things that are out of the norm, you're going to come in, they're going to see you and say, hey, something's not right. We need to do a further workup. You can also have a chronic infection, and this can be one of two ways, where I meet somebody maybe for a second opinion. They've had pain and symptoms for over a year. And when you go back through the history, they had this bout of drainage after surgery. They were treated with pills, antibiotic pills. They did lots of wound dressing changes, and eventually the drainage stopped. But They've had this low-grade, slow-growing infection that now, at a year or two, is manifest into a chronic infection. Now, there's also this other type of infection, which is sort of acute, but it's also late. So this would be acute hematogenous. So this means that you were normal. You had a, no a normal total knee that was functioning well for years. There was no infection. But then you got sick somewhere else in your body. So you had some infection somewhere, and that bacteria went into the bloodstream what we call bacteremia. And then that one little bacteria cell floating by your knee says, hey, I'm going to stop here. And then one becomes two and two becomes four and four becomes eight. And now you have an acute infection in a previously normal total knee, but because you were infected, you had an infection somewhere else. And this led to a knee infection. So we talk about acute early, chronic, late, um, but you can also have this acute hematogenous where it goes through the bloodstream into your knee, which was otherwise doing well. So again, what are the symptoms? Whether or not it's acute or chronic, it's going to be red. It's going to be warm. It's going to be swollen. One of the other common things that we see in infected joints is this painful ability of not, not wanting to bend or straighten it. Just any movement hurts. I mean, it's normal to have pain. You had a knee replacement, but this is pain that is getting worse or pain that's out of proportion. A, a telltale sign is drainage. So if you see chronic drainage, and not just a little bit of blood or serous fluid the first couple days after surgery, but it's just draining, especially if it's draining white purulent material or pus, that's infected. We also see some chronic infections where it's hard to you know get into the diagnosis with lab tests. We'll talk about that in a moment. But you've had this, what we call sinus tract. So there's a hole that goes from the skin into the knee joint, and that's been there for a long period of time. That's a chronic infection. You know, that's until proven otherwise, that's an infection, the joint's infected. Um, so all of those are kind of symptoms that may bring you in to see the doctor. And then the doctor's going to take a look and see, does your knee look red? Does it look swollen? Is there fluid inside the knee? Are there other things that don't look normal? They're going to probably get an x-ray. So if you haven't had x-rays recently, we'll get an x-ray. 
And an x-ray early on, so if you had a surgery a few weeks ago, an x-ray now is not really going to show much. Um, but if you had a chronic infection, what we can see is actually holes in the bone or cavities, just like you would in your teeth. If you had a cavity for a year and they took an x-ray, they're going to see little holes or pockets. So if you've had bacteria in your knee for a while, that bacteria can eat into the bone and you'll see little cavities in and around the knee, around the knee replacement. And that could indicate that there's a chronic infection. But the next most important series um, of tests to confirm that you have an infection and what the infection is, meaning what bacteria is actually in your knee, is a series of tests. So we'll do blood tests. These blood tests, there's a lot of them that you can do. Most commonly, you'll hear these two blood tests called a SED rate or ESR and your C-reactive protein or CRP. And they're what we call sensitive but not specific, meaning they'll be high if there's an infection, but they can be high for lots of reasons. So if you just had surgery and you tested those blood tests, they're going to be high, but they're going to come back down to normal. If you've had surgery and those numbers are going up, um, or if they were previously normal, you had them done for some other reason, and now years down the road, they're high. Again, that may indicate something's going on. Um, and in this particular case, it could be an infection. So you go, okay, those labs are high. What's next? Now we need to take fluid. So your doctor will set up a test where they do an aspiration, where they'll put a needle into your knee and draw fluid out. Again, if it comes out as pus, it's infected. Um, now, sometimes it can look white and cloudy and actually be gout. So you can have a gouty total knee, and we treat that just like you would treat gout in any other joint. But if there's an infection, um, usually it's obvious if you pull the fluid out. It just doesn't look normal, but it's still sent off to the lab. Sometimes the fluid can look clear or bloody and still be infected. So it goes off to the lab, and there's a number of tests that we do. So we look at the cell count, and the lab will give back a number of um, labs, what we call the differential. So we're looking at those numbers to help us determine is there an infection or is there not an infection. And then there's also cultures that are sent out and the cultures will grow bacteria. And this allows us to know what bacteria it is to determine what best antibiotic to put you on. Sometimes the cultures don't grow. There's some bacteria that are hard to grow in a lab. And we would call their culture negative infection, meaning you had all of these other criteria that the cell counts were high, your sed rate C reactive protein were high, it was draining. Those are all signs it's infection, but what we call culture negative. And there's sometimes other special tests that are sent out. So sometimes you'll send out for a PCR, you'll do DNA sampling to determine what bacteria it is. Or there's another special test called alpha defensin, which can be very helpful. If you're sort of in between based on the labs, they're all subtly elevated and you're not sure, um, the alpha defensin is a great test that can help confirm that there is an infection in the knee. Um, but all of this information taken together helps your doctor tell you Yes, unfortunately, you have an infection in your total knee, or no, you don't. Um, now, if you have an infection, and this is where it gets a little complicated, you really need to talk to your doctor. There's a lot of different ways to treat this because it depends on the person. It depends on the timing um, as to what you can do. Now, do you ever treat these without surgery? Almost never. You can't treat and get rid of an infected knee in a total knee without doing some type of surgery. You may suppress it, so I've had over the years some patients that refuse surgery. Or we've had some patients come in with a chronic infection. They were very old and sick and they wouldn't tolerate a big surgery. And we suppress them. So you can put these people on antibiotics for life. It does not get rid of the infection, but hopefully it keeps the infection at a manageable level where it doesn't make them sick. And they're always under the understanding where if this were to get worse and fail that, surgery may be the only option. The next option, um, and probably the least invasive, it's still a big deal in, uh, as far as surgery, would be to go in and replace the modular parts. So the plastic part is modular, um, and what you can do is go in and remove that plastic part. And then do a complete, what we call synovectomy or debridement. This is really, really thorough. This is cleaning out all the, the tissues and spaces and gutters anywhere where bacteria might hide, is to get all of that out. And then wash. There's a number of different irrigation solutions that we can use to, again, help kill off any bacteria that might still be left in even after the debridement. And then after that, putting a new plastic insert in, closing the knee up, um, and then at that point, a course of antibiotics. And typically, most people will be on IV antibiotics for six or eight weeks, and that is determined based on what bacteria you have growing on those cultures. 
Sometimes we know and sometimes we can't determine. So sometimes people are put on what we call broad spectrum antibiotics. There are multiple antibiotics to control or kill off multiple types of bacteria that we assume are in there. But it's much easier when you can really determine, oh, this is the bacteria and this is the best antibiotic to put that person on. The next question always comes down is, do you then put someone on oral or pill antibiotics after that for a period of time? And the data keeps coming in. This is a very case-by-case -case basis, being what bacteria it was, what your health status is, what the knee looked like at the time of surgery, how you responded to the treatment. So those are dis decisions and discussions to be had with your surgeon. Now, sometimes we also do what's called a, a single stage, where this is not just removing the modular part, but this is actually going into the operation, taking everything out, washing and debriding everything, recutting the bone, repairing everything, putting a whole new knee replacement in. And you may have seen, if you haven't already, watched my video on the revision so you can see the difference in the components. Um, but then again, a course of IV antibiotics, possibly then followed by a course of oral antibiotics. Um, the other option would be what's called a two-stage. And what a two-stage is, is typically for someone that has a chronic infection, or maybe you had an acute infection, but you failed to get better with just washing it out and doing a modular component exchange. This is where we actually go and take everything out and put in a temporary spacer. Um, and, and temporary because in, in the past, they were what we call static. Um, basically a hockey puck made of antibiotic impregnated cement that would get put in there. The knee was held straight for six or eight weeks. It wasn't a very functional um, way for people to get around. The knees tended to get very, very stiff, and sometimes those things could dislodge. So more frequently, what people do nowadays is we will make a spacer usually out of a knee replacement. So you get a new thigh bone part and a plastic insert. Sometimes you can make some of those parts out of cement. And the idea is that it allows some range of motion of the knee, and that allows you to sit sit on a toilet, sit in a chair. It's a lot more functional. Um, but sometimes there are people that are too sick to go on to the second stage. So some of these functional spacers, which were supposed to be temporary, have been in for a long period of time. So people definitely put them in. I myself put them in a little bit more under that risk of if I can't ever come back here, this should last a long period of time. But in no way it is as good as a regular knee replacement. The idea is it is temporary. And if we can put that in with antibiotics mixed in with the cement to, again, elute antibiotics, you're basically killing bacteria in the knee from the knee inside out, as well as from IV antibiotics that you get in your vein from outside in. Um, and that hopefully eradicates the infection. And then if the labs look good and the wound looks good, then we can go back, take out that temporary spacer, rewash, redebreed, reclean, reprep, and then put a new knee replacement in. Again, this revision knee replacement that has stems and occasionally we have to make up for the bone loss by putting in special um, augments or wedges. It's like building with a tinker toy set. You're putting all these parts to make up for where you, the patient, have lost bones so the knee can be functional. Is this knee now normal? No. Um, again, that the more surgeries that you have, the less normal the knee feels. And, and it's one of the risks that you can get an infection in the first place. Let's say you know, you had an ACL reconstruction and then a fracture and you had plates and screws. Those multiple operations have changed the tissue around your knee. And that makes those people more at risk of getting an infection. So now, if you've had a knee replacement, even though it was a virgin knee, and now you had an operation to take out the knee because it was infected and put a temporary knee in, and then go back later and take out the temporary knee and put a new knee replacement in a revision knee, you've had three operations on the knee and an infection. And the tissue's woody, it's stiff. Um, the knee usually aches more, it, it might hurt more, it may just not feel the same. It may look fuller because of scar tissue. So it is not a normal total knee. And again, I always say that a knee replacement's not a normal knee, um, but a knee replacement is much better than a bad arthritic knee. A revision knee is a salvage operation in a lot of ways. It gives you back a knee that you can stand on, you can walk on, you can still exercise on, but it's not a normal total knee. It won't feel the same. But it's much better than the severe end of the road risk, which would be an amputation. And that, unfortunately, for a few people, um, is the end result where somebody has an infection that can't be cured, it can't be eradicated, it gets into the bone, 
there is a time where the infection is so bad and so severe that everything that can be done has been done and the person is at risk of further sickness, what we call sepsis, where the infection can travel into your bloodstream and affect the rest of your body. And in those cases, sometimes the only option is an above the knee amputation. So I hope for all of you listening that none of you have to go through this and this is just information and an understanding of what could happen. The unfortunate reality is I'm sure some of you watching this are probably going through this or about to go through this. Um, the people that haven't had to go through this, that are watching this before knee replacement, understand this is why we optimize people like you before surgery. If you can lower any risk factors that you have to decrease your chance of getting an infection, do so. You do not want to go through an infection. If you did get an infection, unfortunately, these are the steps and processes that you have to go through. So just understand, it's a long road, um, but for a lot of people, once they're treated, uh, they can get back on with their life. It's just, you know, I tell patients, expect a year of your life to get through these surgeries and treatments and recovery and rehab to kind of get back to where you thought you were going to be before any of this happened. So um, again, I hope none of you have to go through this, but for those of you that do, I hope that you find this information helpful and maybe it answers some of the questions that you might have. And at least it should give you a, a way of making a list of questions that you can go over with your surgeon so you can have a very good discussion and informed consent prior to going through this so you really understand all the steps of what you're going to have to go through in the next few weeks and months. So until next time, stay safe. I'm Adam Rosen. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time.